All right. Let's turn to the book of Revelation as we continue to go there. And we'll start in Revelation chapter 2, I believe it is today. Uh, Revelation chapter 2. As we begin though, I want to do a little bit of a recap as we think about how we got there. In Revelation chapter 1, we have the Apostle John presenting us with these visions of Christ, visions of God, visions of the Holy Spirit, so that we are overwhelmed with His transcendence, overwhelmed with His glory, so that looking to Him, looking to God, we can be overwhelmed with Him rather than be overwhelmed with all the things going on around about us, so that we can be focused on how great things are going to be with our God, how great our life can be with our God, rather than how horrible things might seem at the present. So as we are looking at all of these visions in Revelation 1, we need to remember that's the main message. Whenever we get to Revelation 2, we begin to see the Apostle John recording these letters to the seven churches. Now these seven churches fall in order of the ancient mail route that we would expect uh, any good mailman to, to take if he was carrying the letters from Ephesus throughout this region. So we see, I believe, that these are real congregations. Now that's important to note because there's some folks that do not believe these are real congregations. They're just letters that are sent out uh, over time and maybe each of these seven churches represents a specific period in church history. I don't believe that at all. What I believe or what I understand is that these are real congregations. The Lord writes to them as though they are real congregations. It follows a mail route along this area. So I expect that these are real congregations that we are looking at. But then it is interesting that we have the seven churches. We have already had uh, the number seven a couple of times representing totality. So the number seven represents completeness. It can represent God, but here it represents just completeness or the completeness of all of God's people. So as we look here at these letters to the seven churches of Asia, what we will find is that all of these things that we'll be looking at have to do with all of us. Now there's only one congregation amongst the seven that doesn't receive any rebuke or uh, recommendation whatsoever. But the rest of them all have problems. The rest of them all have things that they need to work on. So we can identify with each of them, can't we? Because we all have things that we need to work on in our lives. And as a congregation, we all have things that we can work on. There's not a perfect congregation in the whole world. A lot of people spend a lot of their lives looking for that perfect church, but it just ain't there. And as soon as you show up, you usually just bring more problems uh, for the congregation because you're not perfect either. But whenever we look here at these seven churches, we see God walking amidst, in their midst. He is fellowshipping with them. He is with them. He is encouraging them. He is there with these people in spite of their troubles, in spite of their problems, he is encouraging them to do better. And we will see as the Lord writes to these churches that he is encouraging them to do better and warning them that if they do not repent, that their candlestick will be removed. Their place with God's fellowship will be terminated. Now, this is a warning that we all need to take very seriously. Because sometimes we can say, well, we all got problems and so we'll just be okay with just having problems. But that's not the message that we find in Scripture. Instead, when we look in Scripture, we find that we all have problems and those problems are opportunities for us to do better. They're not opportunities for us to settle. They're opportunities for us to do better, to repent and live for the Lord. So the first congregation that we look at here in Revelation 2 is the church at Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is an incredibly important church in Scripture. You'll remember at one time, the church at Ephesus had working in it Paul, Barnabas, and the Apostle John, and Luke there as their helper. Now, if you've got a ministry team like that, I don't know how you can't have success. Any one of those would draw a, a great interest and would be an incredible work for these individuals. But here we have at Ephesus this incredible concentration 
of God's people. Now, the city of Ephesus, as we read there in uh, Revelation 2, was set up on a hill surrounded with walls. And so they were rather content in the place that they were. They were rather content to be there, surrounded with their boundaries, surrounded with these walls, surrounded by borders, so that they felt like everything was going to be okay. But maybe you know what happens whenever you've got great walls all around you. You begin to put your trust in the wall, and you sort of give up. You're not really on alert anymore because the walls are there. You can trust in the wall, and you don't have to be very careful. That's one of the dangers of uh, maybe driving a Tesla. I really want a Tesla, by the way. But that's maybe one of the dangers of driving a Tesla, is that you let it drive itself, and you don't really pay attention to the road anymore. Maybe some of us are afraid that if we all start driving Teslas, we'll all forget how to drive. I'm not sure some of you knew how to drive to begin with, but uh, if we're all letting these cars drive us around, then we'll leave some uh, driving skills behind. The days of Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Sr. are maybe behind us if we are all enjoying these self-driving cars. Well, that's what happened in Ephesus. They had these boundaries, they had these walls, and so they just relaxed. They weren't really concerned about what kept them safe anymore. But also here in Ephesus, you'll remember that they have a lot of different pagan temples going on. The Apostle Paul ran into one of these cults, and it caused him problems. Do you remember the name of this particular cult? They ho hollered out for hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And for hours and hours they yelled, thousands of people, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, until finally they ran Paul out of town, or Paul was rescued out of town. We also see that there is a temple devoted to Zeus, and probably one devoted to the Caesar there in Ephesus. And so we have this city that's very wealthy, very rich. At one time, very early, we have what would have been an incredible congregation with the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, uh, with Barnabas and Luke, all ministering there. But when we get to Revelation 2, toward the end of the first century, even with all that great potential, you see that things aren't quite what they're supposed to be. So, Jesus says to the angel in the church at Ephesus, write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks among the seven golden lampstands, or the seven golden candlesticks. So we have Jesus presented to us, or Jesus is presenting himself to us, as the one who holds these people in his hand and the one who is walking in their midst. Now this is hugely important that we maintain this image, because it is one that is emphasized in Revelation over and over again, that God holds us, and God is walking in our midst, that God truly is with us. Now whenever you are held, you are supposed to experience comfort, security, knowing that everything's going to be all right. And whenever we think about God being with us, we are supposed to remember this is the grand ambition of God throughout all of Scripture. The fellowship that was broken in Genesis 3 is promised that God will restore so that He will be among His people, they will be His people, and they will be, and He will be uh, their God. And then finally we see Jesus tabernacling among the people in John 1, 14, only to tell the people at His ascension, Behold, or lo, I will be with you always. So what do we find here Jesus emphasizing to these congregations in Asia and these congregations here in Ripley, Mississippi? I hold you and I'm walking in your midst. I'm protecting you and I am with you. So he says here in verse 2, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Now let's stop right there for a second. We have different words describing how we work. He first of all says, I know your works. Now work here is the big stuff. 
the stuff that really takes a lot of effort, big programs, big planes, uh, plans, big efforts. These are the works. But then he goes on to describe the toil. The toil here is uh, copious activity. In fact, that's the Greek word behind the word toil. It's the little minute details. So we have both of these things together. The big, you know, things that you just got to put an incredible amount of work into. And then also the small stuff that you're taking care of, the details. Now, how many of you are detailed people? We got two. <laughs> All right. We got three, okay. Well, I'm not a detailed person either. I'm more of a big picture guy. I like doing big ideas. I like doing big stuff. The details I don't really care much for. So... That's really sort of a personality thing, isn't it? And isn't it great that here at the congregation at Ripley, and I imagine the congregation at Ephesus, that we had different people with different personalities that can take care of different things. They can take care of the big stuff, and they can take care of the small stuff, the detail stuff, the copious labor, because God has equipped that congregation with both personality types, because God has equipped that congregation with all the people it needs to get all of God's work done, so that we're not all big picture stuff, we're not all detailed stuff, but instead we are one church doing all the stuff. Everything that needs to get done can in fact get done. Now that doesn't excuse us from helping where help needs. But it does show us that we have different skill sets, different things that we can do for the Lord, and those are the things that we need to work on. So he says, I know your works, your toil, and then your patient endurance. How that you are holding up under pressure. Now this is one that we all have to do, is because the pressures of life are continually beating us down. And it's difficult to hold up. It's easy to start out. It's easy to do something for just a little while. It's easy to be faithful for a moment. But what is prized here is the fact that they are holding up under pressure. They are enduring for a long time. We see throughout Scripture the Christian life described as one of these marathons. You can maybe do some research on the first marathon that ended at marathon. That's why we call it a marathon. But these long distance runs that we see described perhaps also in Hebrews chapter 12, where whoever is preaching the book of Hebrews says that we are to look to Jesus as we run the race, the marathon set before us. This is what we are continually supposed to do. But how many of you just love running marathons? Now, I know there's a couple of you, but it ain't me. So whenever we're thinking about running the long-distant Christian life, we're not thinking about doing little sprints. Instead, it is this endurance, that we're here for the long haul, that we are here to do things for all of our life. That's one of the reasons why senior saints and congregations are so precious, because they are continuing. It's easy to start out, but as we continue, you see, we are being more seasoned. We are, by God working on us through His Word and providence, we are becoming more helpful. We are becoming more useful to the church. We are becoming all the time better leaders and better servants so that as we are getting toward the end, we can really do our best work. We can do the most for the Lord then, can't we? Because we have been trained and developed over time. So the church at Ephesus was doing great at all of this stuff. They were doing the big stuff, the works. They were doing the toil, the small stuff. And they were holding up under pressure. But as we go on a little bit more, we see that they're doing something else. He says, you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be Faults. So, just like the massive walls that protected Ephesus, you see the Christians here had learned to protect sound doctrine. They had the appropriate scriptural barriers up. They were protecting themselves from 
error, from heresy. Here particularly, we have those that claim to be apostles and are not. Now, the Bible tells us that in order to be an apostle, you had to have been with the Lord from the baptism of John up until the ascension of Jesus. So that limits a time frame, does it? But as we have that limited time frame, we also have some people who look at what the apostles are able to do, look at the authority that they have, we see them looking at the position that they have, and these outsiders want those things because people really do want power, don't they? They want authority, they want esteem, they want to be prized. And so as they are looking at the apostles, they want to be an apostle. Well, they really just want the benefits of the office. They don't really want to do the work of the office. They just want to have or enjoy the benefits. And so in order to get these people to serve them, these false apostles begin to claim to be apostles. They begin to tell people that they have messages from the Lord. They begin to tell them that they are speaking authoritatively and they should be adored just like the apostle John, adored just like the apostle Paul, because they too are apostles. But whenever people do that, generally speaking, they will try to win people over by being a bit more lax. Because whenever you're trying to win people over, that's what you do, isn't it? You tell them that they can do whatever they want to do. You tell them, yeah, it's all right, you, you pursue that. You're right, you're great, there's nothing at all wrong with you. Now, this is common in a lot of different areas of life, if it be with people trying to uh, gain uh, political prestige or people trying to gain a large religious influence. Trying to win over people often entails making them think that you love absolutely everything about them and you're going to support absolutely everything they want to do and you're never going to tell them no. Well, this fits in with some different problems that were present in the ancient church. We have this idea of Gnosticism that's beginning to grow. And Gnosticism, while it is not fully there yet, is an idea that the flesh, everything physical, is sinful. And so, your flesh is going to be sinful, and you can't do anything about it. But you as a spirit person, you can be holy. But your flesh is always going to be sinful. So you can really just let your flesh enjoy the sins of the flesh and not worry about it. Because the flesh is sinful and you're spiritual, so you just go ahead and enjoy the works of the flesh, and it's not going to cause you any problem. You see how that this can be grafted into a Christian message. So that, you see, grace is covering all the things your flesh is doing. You just don't worry about it at all. You just sin all you want to because in reality, eventually the flesh will be destroyed and your spiritual self will continue forever. So this is maybe what's going on here at Ephesus. This is maybe what is happening with these people who are surrounded with pagan influences, surrounded with pagan worship centers in which the sins of the flesh were exalted to the position of worshiping the gods. You can see how that would be a powerful pull, can't you? And so here we have those who claim to be apostles and are not. He said, you have tested them and found them to be false. Well, how did they test them? You see, just like the city of Ephesus, they have these walls. They have these boundaries. So that they are able to look at claims on one hand and to look at Scripture on the other hand and see which way it is I need to go. To examine the things that are taught by what God has taught to examine the ideas that are being presented by what God himself has said. This is what the Bereans are doing after all, isn't it? They were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they were examining the things that were taught by Paul, comparing it with the word of God to see whether or not it was so. 
And so here, these well-trained theologians here in Ephesus, they are doing what? You see, they've been taught by Paul, John, and Luke, and Barnabas. And so when they have these false apostles come in, they're able to examine what they're saying and see if what they have been taught is real. These apostles, or pseudo-apostles, have found themselves are found to be false, and so the church there in Ephesus does not bear with them. They do not endure them. They do not endure this false doctrine. They kick them out because they choose not to repent and because they are a threat to the church. So in verse 3 he says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. You see, they are accustomed to this, aren't they? They've got the walls, they've got the barriers, and spiritually they've got the truth so they know what's outside and they know how to keep what's outside on the outside They've got a good, firm, protective boundary between them and what is wrong so that they're able to keep safe. They've got the doctrine right. He says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, but you have not grown weary. But in verse 4 he says, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. You have abandoned the first love. As we think about this problem, perhaps we find that we can identify with it a bit because the church here at Ephesus had all the doctrine right. They had the barriers up, but what they didn't have was what's important as well on the inside. They didn't have the love they had at first. Now, they had their working in Ephesus, John. They had Barnabas, these great encouragers, the great apostle of love. They had Paul. They had uh, Luke. They had great servants. They had this incredible beginning. But now what are they lacking? Love. Now, are we talking about a love for God or a love for one another? We can look at that question, but here's the thing. If you're going to love one another appropriately, you've got to love God appropriately. And if you love God appropriately, you're going to love your Christian family appropriately too. So the problem is you can't separate this. It's like those jars of peanut butter and jelly. Once you put them in a jar, there ain't no separating them, right? Now you can kind of do it with Neapolitan ice cream, but you can't do it with peanut butter and jelly once you get that in a jar. So whenever we are told to love... We must love God and we must love our church family. He says, you have lost the love that you have had at first. And this is essential for you being a Christian. Jesus is going to go on and warn these people that if you don't start loving more fervently, I'm going to remove your place as a church. Now we are in a position to empathize with them perhaps because we often emphasize what is right and what is wrong doctrinally, but how often do we emphasize that we must actually love people and that we must actually love the Lord? You see, we're a lot like Ephesus at times, aren't we? We're a lot like Ephesus at times because we can begin to think of religion as a checklist of things we have to do and do correctly, when in fact... It is also one that must be done with love. You remember the Apostle John, who preached there at Ephesus, also wrote that we love because he first loved us. So then the love of God is what shapes everything about us. Jesus told us that we keep his commandments because we love him. And that keeping His commandments is a way that we display our love for Him. But notice the foundation is affection. The foundation is affection. Now how is it that we are going to get our affection right? That's a deeper problem than trying to get things intellectually right, isn't it? I remember a couple of years ago I was having a Bible study with a family... And I, they were really smart folks. 
And intellectually, I think they understood everything that we were studying from the Bible together, but their heart just wasn't for it. And emotionally, they would check out. Emotionally, they would reject God. Emotionally, they would reject the things of God because their heart was just somewhere else. Church, we have got to actually love the Lord. We have to have this adoration of God because it's not enough just to have the right doctrine. We must also have the right love, a love that is fueled by the love of God itself a love that is brought about because God first loves us. The only way I know to do that, to cultivate that sort of love, that sort of affection, is to, number one, be in awe of the transcendence of God. Be in awe of the otherness or the holiness of God. As we begin to do that, we can legitimately stand back and be in awe of his infinitude. We can just be overwhelmed with his glory. Do you ever do that with things? Do you ever just stand back and be in awe of something? It's hard to do in creation because eventually you can figure out just about anything in creation because it's finite. But as we think about God, you see, we can just be absolutely awestruck for all eternity because he's infinite. So we've got to learn to focus on these things of God that are utterly different than us. Number two, we also need to be in love with the Lord. We need to actually love Him, and the only way that's going to happen is if we spend time learning about Him and building this relationship through Scripture. So that as we are reading about Jesus, we're not just reading about Jesus, but instead we're building a relationship with Him that causes us to fall in love with Him and want to serve Him and want to obey Him. So that, as Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. You see, people aren't usually drawn to interesting facts and figures. Now, I like to watch the History Channel. Y'all like to watch the History Channel? Especially late at night when they get the weird people on there. You know, the, the ancient aliens. They're like my favorite because... I don't know, I'm thinking, sometimes I'm thinking, man, I could be on TV too. Uh, but uh, I like to just learn stuff, little tidbits. That's just, you know, part of my personality. I like to learn his, about history, about Egypt, about ancient Rome. I like that stuff. But I don't just fall in love with Egypt. But as you are learning about Jesus, you see, you are developing a relationship you are learning to actually love a person because he loved you first, because he has revealed himself to you. Read the Bible. Fall in love with God and let him nurture that relationship as he speaks to you in his scripture and reveals his affection for you. This is essential for the Christian life. So let's go on here with the church in Ephesus. He says, I have this against you that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. He doesn't say you've abandoned love. He says you've abandoned the love you had at first. It's not as strong as it ought to be. It's not as fresh as a new love. It's a love that's grown old and a love that's grown cold. Go back to the love you had at first. Go back to that zeal. Go back, go back to that overwhelming love that you're supposed to have for the Lord and for His people. He says in verse 5 then, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Here in verse 5, we have the great physician telling us how to rekindle love. Now this can work not just with the Lord, but this, this prescription that the Lord gives us, it, it can work in your marriage. It can work with other people that you care about in your family, other relationships that you have. He says, first of all, there in verse 5, remember from where you've fallen. Here in this context, he's saying, remember what you had at the beginning. Now, what did you have at the beginning? 
Do you remember when you were first obedient to the gospel? you remember when you were first saved? you remember how that felt? He says, you go back and know those things again. Go back and reminisce over the way you felt when you first become a Christian. Now, you do that in relationships too, don't you? You go back and you remember when your children were little, and that love for your children just grows, doesn't it? You go back and you remember when you first met your spouse. Doesn't that make you feel better? Doesn't that make you to love your spouse a bit more? He says, go back and remember the love that you had at first. When at first you were overwhelmed with God's love for you, and you would not do anything but yield to Him and serve Him. It's important we do that because things have a way of growing normal. Things have a way of growing normal. We get accustomed to the opportunity that we have in prayer. We get accustomed with the opportunities we have to worship uh, without the fear of oppression. We get accustomed to waking up in the morning and your spouse is there. But those things aren't givens. Those things can be taken away quite quickly. So as we look back to what Jesus is saying, he's saying, go back and remember when you were overwhelmed with love. Because apparently that's the way we're supposed to be. Not just in our marriages, but also with the Lord. Go back and remember when you were overwhelmed with love. And then he says, repent, change your mind, and then what? Do the first works. Go back and remember what you had. Decide you're going to have what you had and not what you're stuck with. Go back to what you had and then do the first works. Do the things you did at the beginning. What made you happy at the beginning of your life together? What made you happy at the beginning of your marriage? What made you happy when you started dating that person? Now he says, what made you happy? What was it that you were doing that you loved doing when you first became a Christian? When you first became a Christian, did you study your Bible better than you do now? Maybe you need to start doing that again. When you first became a Christian, did you ever miss a worship service? Probably not. Maybe you need to start being at church again. When you first became a Christian, were you involved in the local church and being a, an important part of the local church? Were you a part of that assembly, not just a part of you know, someone sitting in the pew, but actually used and utilized and doing things for the Lord, actually a part of God's work in the kingdom there in that congregation? You remember that love you had at first? Go back and do the first works. Go back and invest yourself in the Lord. That's one of the great things that keeps people faithful is when they are actually invested. You see, if I just put on a show for you, I'm not doing you any service at all. But if we find ways for you to be invested in the church, invested in the kingdom, actually you doing things, you will find that you love the church more, you love the Lord more, and you want to do even more the more invested you get. Never become a spectator. Always be an active part of the congregation. Always be someone that is uh, invested, doing things that needs to be done. So he says, repent and do the works you did at first. If you do not do this, Notice here he says, you've got the right doctrine, but if you don't love me correctly, if you don't have an overwhelming love for me, Jesus says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Not just if you have the right doctrine, but also if you have the right love. I know some people that have love, but they don't have the right doctrine. And I know some people that have the right doctrine, but they don't have love. Here the church at Ephesus is a reminder that Jesus wants us to have both. To be loving and to be doctrinally healthy. We need both of these. He says, if you do not have both, if you do not have love, I will come remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. In verse 6, Jesus ends on this encouraging note. He says, yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. 
Now, who are the Nicolaitans? We don't know. We don't know who they are. Uh, we think that they are a part of this early, early, early Gnostic movement that I talked to you about earlier. These people that are saying the flesh is sinful, you can't do anything about it, so just go ahead and sin, you can't stop it anyway. Perhaps they are a part of this Gnostic group that is in some way influencing Christians, and he says, you hate their works. It's pretty strong language, isn't it? You see, we've been talking about how we should love God. Now he says you need to hate these evil works. That contrast is supposed to stand out to us, that we hate their false ways. Then in verse 7, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who has an ear is the one who is not given over to idolatry. When you read through the uh, pre-exilic prophets, the prophets before the exile to Babylon, you will find the Lord ridiculing the people because they make these idols that can't hear. They don't have ears that can hear. They're just created things by created things. Okay, So the Lord picks up that terminology. And throughout the Gospels, you can see Jesus saying this. And then again here in Revelation, you see Jesus ridiculing his own people, saying, do you have ears to hear? Are you going to live better than those idols? Are you going to be different than that pagan idol that's been made? It, that is just there for the use of flesh, for the use of our physical desires. Are you going to be better than that? Or are you going to actually be something of worth, something of value, something that is able to hear from God? You see, that's the way we've been elevated, isn't it? It's the way we've been elevated above the rest of creation. And especially as God's people, we have been elevated so that we are able to hear the things of God. Jesus is in effect saying, are you going to make the most of this relationship that God has given you? Are you going to make the most of the value that God has placed within you? Are you going to make the most of your life? Do you have ears to hear? Are you willing to hear and act on what God has said? Hearing has to do more with just actually, you know, hearing a sound. It has to do with accepting and acting on. Do we have these ears to hear? Then he says, to the one who conquers or the one who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You see how the Garden of Eden has been reversed? The tree of life, you can live forever, you can have that uh, paradise experience again, if you will listen to God. You can have life to the fullest. Instead of what the Gnostics say, you can have this true life with love, doctrine, but also a relationship with the Lord if you have ears to hear. All right, we'll be dismissed for a little bit and we'll come back.